So today, we complete our sermon series, Unsung Heroines, celebrating heroic women of the faith. And we have looked at some amazing women over the past five weeks. We've looked at Hannah and Deborah and Ruth and Abigail. We've met the five daughters of Zelophehad. And then last week, Pastor Clay introduced us to the Seraphonician woman. Some are people that you may have never heard of before. Some weren't even identified by name. And as we close this series on unsung heroines, I think that it's only fitting that we shout out the unsung heroes and heroines in our midst today. Pastor Peter already prayed for them. And and we're talking about those who are healthcare workers and those who are firefighters and police officers, those of you who work in grocery stores and those of you who um, during this time can't stay home. But every day you go out and you leave your families, you leave your homes so that you can help make us safe. And so we are grateful to you. So if that is you, we ask wherever you are, just please stand up. We know it's a little awkward, it might seem a little silly, but just stand up and take a bow wherever you are. And for the rest of us, let's just give them a hand. We're just gonna give you a virtual hand of applause. Because we are so grateful for you, and we thank you. And in this season especially, we come to know that um, you truly are essential. And we see you, and we recognize you. And even though we may never know your names, all of you personally, we do appreciate the impact that you've had on our lives. So today we'll be talking about a woman who does not go unnoticed by Jesus at all. In fact, she doesn't go unnoticed by anyone. Her actions are so focused and so audacious that it brought ridicule from men, but it brought praise from Jesus. It was a season of chaos in the region. There's a celebration, but there's also so much uncertainty. And this woman, who Mark never actually tells us her name, makes her way to Jesus in the midst of the chaos, herself creating lots of chaos. But she finds her way to Jesus and unloads on him all of her worship. What she does is scandalous, it's risky, and it's dangerous. Yet it is so moving that Jesus calls what she does a beautiful thing. With all that is going on around her, how did she focus on Christ? How did she find Christ in the midst of the chaos? I don't have to tell you all how chaotic the world is right now. Things are changing moment by moment. Some of you probably appreciate your child's teacher more than you ever have before. Some of you realize that homeschooling and working from home were never meant to go together. Some of you may love your parents, you may love your spouse, but they are driving you crazy. And so in this time of chaos, How do we find Christ in the midst of all of this? This morning, we are going to let this woman lead us to Jesus. Join us in Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. And it reads as follows. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, he said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Regardless of what was going around her, this woman found Jesus. And when she did, she lavished upon him all her love and all her devotion. When she found Jesus, she worshiped him. She sought him for no other reason but to worship and to bless him. She understood that the secret to finding Christ in chaos is worship. 
The secret to finding Christ in chaos is to worship him. But the challenge of chaos is that it scrambles our minds. It's so unpredictable that it unearths us. It, it shakes us to our core. Our normal has been interrupted. Now, sometimes chaos can be good. The Jews in our passage are preparing for Passover, and, and it's the final week before Jesus is arrested, brought before a bogus trial, beaten, crucified, dies, but then ultimately resurrects. The Passover commemorates the saving of the Israelite people. When God is taking them out of Egypt, he tells them to place the blood of a firstborn lamb over their doorpost so that when the angel of death comes, it will pass over them. The Feast of Unleavened Bread lasted for eight days and is also a part of this commemoration of the Exodus. It memorializes when the people are getting ready to leave Egypt and they had to do so in such a hurry that their bread didn't have time to rise. There was no least yeast or leaven inside of it. Some scholars believe that during the celebration about what would normally be a population of 50,000 people in Jerusalem swelled to hundreds of thousands of people because they all came from all over the region to celebrate their liberation. This is good chaos. They're celebrating one of the largest celebrations of the year. It's going to be a wonderful time for them, but it's chaos nonetheless. It's like your child's first birthday party or the quinceanera or the sweet 16. Good, fun chaos. The wedding or the retirement party. It's wonderful, it's beautiful. The food and the gifts and the, and the clothes and the tables and chairs and decorations. Good chaos but chaos nonetheless. But then there's the bad chaos. In our text, it's the plot to kill Jesus. The high priests and teachers are scheming for a reason to arrest Jesus and ultimately to kill him. And besides the physical chaos, Jesus is dealing with his own spiritual chaos. He knows that he is in a monumental battle for our souls. For many right now, it may feel like the coronavirus is is coming to get us just as quickly. It's moving closer and closer to our acquaintances and loved ones. I think we're overwhelmed by all the information coming at us from the federal government and state and county and local. Add to that the articles retweeted and forwarded and emailed and texted to you. It's becoming chaotic. Managing care for loved ones, homeschooling your kids, trying to meet your own deadlines and benchmarks, watching the economy, deciding can you go outside or not? Can you order food or not? So many questions, so much going on, it's chaotic. But if we want the chaos to stop, it's not going to be found on a website. It's not going to be found on my beloved Netflix. (laughs) And it's not even going to be found in the arms or the eyes of someone you love It's found in Christ. It's found in the one who calms the stormy seas. It's found in the one who's the Prince of Peace. It's found in the one who says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How do we get to Christ in the midst of the crazy? How do we find him in the chaos? First, to find Christ in the midst of chaos, you must seize the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. If this woman would have waited for an opportune time to come, she would have never found it. Look at verses six and seven. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. While the disciples complained about what this woman was doing, Jesus praised her because he knew that his time on earth was coming to an end. He would be crucified soon. This is why he tells them, the poor you will always have with you, but me, you need to honor me now. Jesus is not dismissing help for the poor. We know better than that. So many times Jesus teaches his disciples to care for the poor. What Jesus is saying is that he will be leaving soon and the time to reach out to him and to worship him is now. He recognizes that this woman seizes the opportunity to lavish on him all of her love and devotion. She knows that she may never have another opportunity 
And if she wants to show her love for Jesus, she must do it now. Some of you are waiting for the opportune time to find Jesus. There are some of you who are watching this who you're not in relationship with Jesus, and you're waiting for when you think the time is right, when you get yourself together, when you stop drinking, when you stop smoking, when you stop doing whatever you think it is that you're doing that's wrong. I have friends who will wait until they get married and have kids before they come back to church. But you can't get yourself together. Christ does that. You can't handle the chaos. Only God can. That's why our vision at Metro is transformation. Not that we make the transformation occur, but that we yield our lives to Christ to allow him to do the transformative work inside of each one of us. The time for Jesus is now. And I don't say that to scare you into fear of death, but actually to welcome you into the love of life in Christ. There is no better time to seize the opportunity to say yes to Jesus than it is now. He is your peace in this time of chaos. And if that's you, when I go through the next steps, there's going to box, there's a, there'll be a box that you can check, or you can just go to our website and email one of the pastors. We'll be happy to get back in touch with you and to journey with you. Now, some of you are already Christians and you're at home in chaos right now. Kids are screaming, adults arguing, toys and games and timers are going off. You may just want a moment to yourself. I've spoken to a lot of mothers these past two weeks and they tell me that they can't even go to the bathroom by themselves anymore. One friend told me that there is never a time where her kids are not calling her name. Can some of you relate? Or maybe you're single and maybe it's not the chaos of a noisy house, but the chaos of silence. You're left with your own thoughts and emotions your demons, and you don't know how to handle them. But let me just be honest with you. The noise, parents, may not stop. And for those of you, the silence may not ever seem like it's actually quiet. You can't wait for the opportune time. You have to determine to make it. In fact, there was no opportune time for what this woman did. According to Jewish custom, there is never a right time for a woman to approach a man, especially a rabbi. Then she comes to dinner where Jesus is the honored guest and she interrupts the dinner to anoint him. She touches him. What she is doing is beyond bold, it's dangerous. This was not the right time for the disciples but it was the right time for her. It was hard, but it was worth it. She saw Jesus and she needed to get to Jesus, and so she did. She's just like the woman with the issue of blood. And she's like the woman, the Seraphonician woman that Pastor Clay told us about last week, who even while Jesus was trying to rest, she went to her. She went to him on behalf of her daughter. These women saw an opportunity to get to Jesus and they took it. This is not the time to be passive. This is the time to be bold in this season and seize the opportunity to get to Jesus. It may mean a shift in your schedule, but when you find the moment, seize it, take it. And it's not just timing, but in your manner. In this moment, look for Jesus in the laughter of your children. Look for him in the warm embrace of your spouse. Search for him in the quiet, still, small voice. Connect with friends, but don't just watch TV all the time. Listen to worship music, watch a sermon, pray, connect with God. We often pray for revival. We sing about revival, we go to revivals, but revival happens during times of crisis, during famines and disease and persecution. This is the time for God's global revival, but revival must begin with us. I think we all thought we would have so much more time. You may have thought, well, since I'm home, I'm gonna finish reading all these books and and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna read my Bible so much more, but it seems like we're busier. You've got to create the moment, take it. God has given us the opportunity to press pause on our lives, to reevaluate what's most important, our family, our friends, 
our relationship with him, our own lives. To find Christ in the chaos, we have to seize this opportunity. Second, to find Christ in the chaos, we must stay focused on Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. Look at verses three through five. While he was at Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. This woman comes in with a jar of very expensive oil, makes a beeline to Jesus, and anoints him from head to toe. This story is found in all four Gospels, and when you read the Gospel of John, you read his account, he tells you that this woman comes, and not only does she anoint his feet with oil, but then she wipes the excess with her hair. The disciples complain about what she's doing. They're actually indignant about it. They call what she's doing wasteful. How dare she, she waste this expensive oil on Jesus when it could have been used for better purposes, they reason. But do you notice that she doesn't stop? Even with the ridicule, even with the mocking, even with the stares. I imagine the disciples are throwing up their hands and they're huffing and puffing and groaning, but she doesn't stop. She is concerned, she is not concerned with what is going on around her at all. I just told you to seize the opportunity and some of you may be rolling your eyes at me right now thinking that's easy for her to say. She's not married and she doesn't have kids running around. And that's true, I don't. And that's why this is especially for you. Because the truth is that Jesus doesn't make it a choice and we don't have a choice either. Our sanity, and most importantly, our relationship with Jesus depends on seizing this opportunity and focusing on him. The chaos may never stop in your home. There was so much chaos around this woman. There were at least 12 hungry disciples. Simon the host, Jesus, not to mention all the servants waiting on them. There's sounds of chatting, there's dishes clanging, people slurping or chewing loudly, servants walking in and out with food, and then an even greater eruption when this woman walks in, yet she still makes her way to Jesus. Find Jesus anyway. Focus on him. Go to that inner place where only you and God reside. It may mean that you have to set up boundaries for yourself. My mother used to tell me and my brother growing up, just give me 10 minutes of peace. That was her request of us. I have a friend whose mother used to play the quiet game with her. Do you guys know the quiet game? If you have small children, tell them to close their ears right now. The quiet game is the first who speaks loses. It was years before she realized that her mom just wanted her to be quiet. You might have to get creative right now. Maybe you and your spouse have to tag team. One is in while the other one is out. If you're a single parent, you might have to bargain with your kids a little bit. And if that doesn't work, just go to that inner place. We all have it. Take a few deep breaths and find that inner place. Many of you have commuted on the bus or subway into the city for work you probably have already mastered the art of tuning people out without even realizing it. I used to commute for a few years and I became so skilled at blocking out all the noise and all that was around me so that I could read. I liked to read, so I would read books, I would read devotions, and I would find my calm in the chaos on a subway in New York City. Now, I am not stupid. I knew to listen out for like, you know, really crazy noises, but for the most part, I was able to tune out what was going on around me so that I could focus on what I wanted to focus on. This woman singularly focused on Jesus. Jesus was her center. Everything else was periphery. Am I telling you to ignore your kids all day long? No. Am I telling you to ignore the mounting numbers of those testing positive for coronavirus? No. What I am saying is that those things need to move to the periphery so that Jesus can be your center. And I know it's hard. 
We think we have more time, but it seems like we don't. We think with less movement in our day-to-day lives that there being less movement in our heads, but that's not true. It's hard, but you know what? <laughs> Life is hard. Choose to focus on Jesus in this time. Whatever you focus on will be your center. It's like a camera. Your subject is where the lens focuses and sharpens. It's so easy to become overwhelmed with all the information inundating us. But if all you are listening to are news reports and increasing numbers, that will become your center. That's where fear takes root. That's where anxiety will begin to overwhelm you. That's where depression and despair and hopelessness reside. Shift your focus to Jesus. Last Saturday, when it was really nice out, I went and I took a walk and I had... um, I had intended to listen to the Hamilton soundtrack because I'm obsessed with it right now. Um, But I ended up listening to the song, Never Lost on repeat. Because what I needed to know in that time is that Jesus has never lost a battle. And that needed to be the message that came to me. You don't need to hear that people are dying. You need to hear that Christ is alive. Meditate on his word. Open up your Bibles. Psalm 121.2 says, My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When you open up Psalm 91.1, you find whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We all know Psalm 23.4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This woman reminds us that even in the midst of chaos, we can stay focused on Jesus. This woman recognizes who Jesus is. She recognizes that he's bigger than societal norms. He's bigger than the chaos around her. She recognizes that Jesus, this man, is the promised Messiah. And when this woman anoints him, she does so in full recognition of who he is. When we give our time and attention to Jesus, even in the midst of all the craziness going on around us, we elevate him above the crazy. We tell our spirits that we're not going to be brought down into despair because Jesus is our hope. We tell our hearts that even if we're feeling uneasy with all the changes and all the disruptions, that Christ is still our constant. We tell our minds that man has no idea, but God is still in control. We have so many questions. Get to know who God is right now. We need to remind ourselves that God is still faithful. He has brought us as a people through so much, and he will do it again. God is still our healer. For all the people who are dying, and they are so very important, there is still an 80% survival rate. God is still our protector. How many people have you come in contact with and yet you are still healthy? God is still in control. And just as he tells the waters how far to come up on the land, in his time, he will tell COVID to go. Stay focused on Christ during this time. So to find Christ in the midst of chaos, we have to seize the opportunity. We have to stay focused on Christ. And finally, we have to look beyond this moment. Look beyond this moment to eternity. The time we spend finding Christ in chaos is for worship. The secret to finding Christ in chaos is worship. Now, I know we all have concerns and prayer requests, but when this woman approaches Jesus, she comes with none of that. She actually never says a thing. She just blesses Jesus. She just worships him. Worship is an expression of adoration to God. In Hebrew, the word is sagad. It means to bow down in humility and in adoration. In Greek, the word is 
Guneo, which means to kiss forward. In worship, we are throwing a kiss to God. Just imagine that for a moment. In worship, we're throwing a kiss to God. Worship is not coming to God to get something. It's coming to give something. God loves our worship. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. This woman pours out her love and adoration on Jesus. Look at verse 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. That is worship. Pouring out all that you have onto God. She breaks open this jar of oil worth about a year's wages for a day laborer, and she lavishes it on Jesus. The most valuable thing she had, she willingly poured it on Christ. That's worship. And in doing so, she not only blesses Jesus in the moment, but she prepares him for his burial and indeed for eternity. What she does reflects the closest human understanding of Jesus's identity and mission before his death. So many times Jesus had told the disciples that he must die, but they didn't get it. But she did, and she did something about it. We never know the power of what we do for Jesus. Now, scholars debate whether this woman actually knew what she was doing. Some suggest that she had no idea, and Jesus sort of superimposes meaning on her actions. But I tend to believe that she may not have known exactly what she was doing, but her intentions, but her actions were intentional and they were prophetic. You see, it was Jewish custom to anoint a dead body with oil after they died in preparation for burial. And in this moment, this woman seizes this opportunity because she realizes that Jesus is essentially a dead man walking. You remember that term. It's the term that's used for men and women on death row when they're taking their final walk from their cell to the execution room. The pronouncement of death has already been placed upon them. And the same was happening with Jesus. He knew that his time was coming quickly to an end. And it's true that this woman anointing him was in fact anointing him for burial. After he was crucified, He was taken down from the cross very close to the beginning of Sabbath, so there was no time to anoint him. This is why we see the women come to the tomb on the third day. They came to anoint him, but it was too late. Jesus was gone. Jesus had already risen. So when this woman has this opportunity now, she takes it. And even though the Bible doesn't say this, I believe that this woman's actions had to have encouraged Jesus. John tells us that the oil was so fragrant that it took up the entire house. The smell filled the house. Can you imagine how that smell must have lingered on Jesus and on his clothes? Perhaps he still smelled it when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and remembered the love and faithfulness of his followers. Maybe he caught a whiff of it when he was being beaten and tortured. Maybe when he he wiped his brow from carrying the cross, he remembered this woman who loved him so much. And even if not the smell, I imagine the image of this woman anointing him was with him when he was on on the cross dying. The Psalms exhort us to bless the Lord. We bless the Lord through our worship. We find Christ in the chaos when we worship him. And her actions didn't just have implications for those few days. They are significant for eternity. Jesus calls what this woman does a beautiful thing. And he promises her that what she has done will not be forgotten. And she is the only person about whom Jesus will say such a thing. Jesus reaches all the way from the past into our present reality to confirm this woman's value and her impact on the gospel message for all of eternity. What she has done 
will be remembered whenever the gospel is preached. And think about it. Here we are, 2,000 years later, preaching the gospel and telling this story in memory of this woman, exactly what Jesus said would happen. Our worship has significance for eternity. Now, one of the saddest lines in this passage is verse 4, where it says, why waste this perfume? I believe the disciples had started taking Jesus for granted. They called what, they were, what this woman was doing a waste. But how could anything spent on or given to Jesus be a waste? Jesus says, no, this is not a waste. In fact, it has implications beyond what you can even imagine. Her actions are to encourage us to imitate her. The most valuable asset we have right now is our time. Pour it out on Jesus. Our goal is always to worship Jesus and lift him up. Worship him with our time and with your actions. Our charge from God in this season is to lift up the name of Jesus. For all the posts you put up on Facebook about COVID-19, how many of them are encouraging people to find their hope in Jesus? For all the calls and text messages, are you sharing the peace of Christ? For all the memes, are you also sharing the gospel message? I know it's chaotic right now. Within a very few short weeks, we went from life as usual to stay-at-home orders. It's stressful. I'm worried about my father who is generally very healthy, but he's in his late 70s and he refuses to stop going to shop right. I'm worried about his wife who's terminally ill. I'm worried about my cousin who's a nurse in Newark. Then there's the stress of this global pandemic hitting this region with a fierceness none of us could have imagined. I can't even keep up with all the numbers. Then there's the reality that we are surrounded by people within our church community and in our greater community who are being hit the hardest. If they haven't stopped already, the paychecks will soon. Some were already struggling before this even happened, and they need us. So while trying to provide for my own needs, I'm looking out for others. So we coordinated calls with local agencies to figure out what's happening in Inglewood. We set up a crisis benevolence fund, and thank you to all of you who have donated. We've put together a really great team of captains and volunteers to go food shopping and, and to pack food and to deliver food for people who cannot get out. We're even partnering with our local food pantry, helping them find volunteers. There are Zoom calls and phone calls and conference calls. There are text messages and too many emails to count. Then there's the news and the articles and fielding information from so many sources and trying to stay up to date. It's chaotic. And last week, week one, y'all, things got a little crazy for me. I started becoming overwhelmed. Now, I'm generally very good in a time of crisis, and I wasn't near the peak of my stress levels at all. But I did realize that if I'm starting to feel stressed now, and we have no idea how long this is going to last, then I needed to start doing something. And I didn't know it consciously, but I think in all of the chaos, I intuitively needed some sort of stability, something constant, something familiar. So my gym started doing these live online classes, and they are great. Staff meetings and small groups have moved to Zoom, so I still get to see my Metro family. And that has helped a lot. But I needed more. And not more people, because I'm an introvert. My soul needed grounding. It needed some stability. And without even realizing it consciously, I started to write out a daily routine. And how many of you know that that got blown out of the water in like two days? <laughs> And then one day last week, I picked up this book that I had received from a pastor that I had interned with when I was in seminary. Now, I had learned about the Book of Common Prayer when I was in seminary, but it wasn't really something that I grew up with. But this book was a little bit more appealing to me because it's justice-oriented. And the book is called Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. And every day, it gives you a short devotion 
It gives you some prayers, and it gives you some scriptures to read. Now, while I don't usually go to this book because I'm not really a liturgy kind of book person, right now it has provided me with structure and a routine. Where all the world around me is changing, this book reminded me that God is my constant. It reminded me that for centuries, men and women have held on to God, their constant in the midst of chaos. That's what our ancestors did. Whether immigrating from another country with only an address and a few dollars, or waiting for emancipation and equal rights, they held on to their faith. Sometimes I read it first thing in the morning, Sometimes it happens at some point later on in the day. I stopped caring about when, I just wanted, it to, to, just wanted to do it. I've been praying according to the daily prayer prompt that Metro has been sending out. And every single night, I read Psalm 91. Psalm 91 reminds me that God is my security. I've got to stay focused on Jesus and I've got to worship. Worship takes you straight from the chaos to the foot of the cross. Last Saturday, um, Tyler Perry sent around this video with others singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. It's a simple song. Many of you may have learned it as a child. I remember singing it at Sunday school, and I never realized how profound it was until last week. Because right now, in the midst of the crisis, the good news is that God has got the whole world in his hands. We find Christ in our chaos when we worship him. Family, I hope and pray that you will not let the chaos overwhelm you, but you will find Christ in it. Seize this opportunity, stay focused on him, and let your worship lead you to Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you that you are our constant in the midst of chaos. God, we thank you that while the world is changing, you have not changed. That you are still faithful, that you are still good, that you are still loving, that you are still kind, that God, you, your steadfast love endures forever. And so God, in the midst of all the chaos, I pray not just for myself, but for all of my brothers and sisters, that we might find ourselves in you. That you would help us to carve out time that we can spend in you. That we would find our peace and our hope and our help in you. God, I lift up all those men and women who have to leave their homes every day on behalf of us. And God, we thank you for them. And we pray your protection around them, Lord God, as they give their lives for us. Lord God, we thank you for this time. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, if you have the Metro app, you know that we, um, we are gonna look at our next steps. And if you don't have it, we're gonna take you right through it right away and just send us an email if it applies to you. Number one, for the first time, I'm ready to put my faith in Jesus. I said it in my message, I'll say it to you now. This is not about scaring you to death. This is about offering you life right now. Jesus loves you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. And if that's you, check that box off if you have the app. If you don't, email us and we will get back in contact with you because that's the most important step that you can take right now. Number two, though others are able to stay home, I still have to go to work and would like prayer for me and my family. There are so many in our congregation that have to go to work right now, and we don't always know who you are. So if you could check that box, we'll get back to you so we can pray specifically for you and for your family. We do thank you, and we just want to know who you are. Number three, I would like to volunteer to help Inglewood and the Metro community during this time. There are so many needs, and we have no idea how long this is going to last. But if you've got a couple of hours, even if you can only do it from home, we would love your help volunteering. We've got people going shopping, we've got people packing baskets, people going out to deliver food, people helping on the administrative side, and some even volunteering with our local food pantry. Number four, I will seize any opportunity I can each day to worship God. You might have to do it in the shower. You might have to go outside for a few moments, wherever you can, find some time to find Christ. And number five, if I need to, 
I will pull away from the news and fill my spirit with worship. I know we want to know what's going on all the time, but you don't need to. If you take a day off, it'll be okay. If you're feeling like your stress levels are too high, take a break, put the news away, and worship.